The nation holds its breath. Yes, we're there! Hello and welcome to This Week Back in the Day. On this episode, we're going to be talking about when the Republic of Ireland beat Brazil on the 23rd of May, 1987. I'm David, your host, joined as always by Martin. Martin, how are you doing? Yeah, this is a brilliant one to cover, Dave. I'm very well, thanks. And I'm looking forward to covering when Ireland beat an iconic nation in football. You know, Brazil are probably one of the greatest ever teams, aren't they? World football. And we beat them in our own backyard. Uh, we did indeed, and a couple of things there. This was not an iconic Brit- Brazilian team, and <laughs> I think most backyards probably had a better playing surface than that <laughs> that day. But we're going to get into it anyway. You're probably thinking, oh, it's just a match. You know, what can he really say about it? Well, we're going to go in, all the stuff kind of behind it, during it, and afterwards. And, and a lot of fascinating points here. I really enjoyed this one, uh, doing the notes. Let's lash into it. Here you are. So the last meeting between the two sides was five years previous and it ended 7-0 to Brazil. It was against a much depleted Ireland team, but that was a very demoralizing loss for Owen Hand's men. Some squeaky bums around the Irish squad around this time, I'd imagine. Uh, Brazil themselves are in the middle of a rebuilding phase. They're knocked out of the quarterfinals by France on penalties the year previous at the Mexican World Cup. Uh, Ireland at this stage had only scored two goals in the last five games. That was one in Scotland. The, the famous 1-0 win in Hamden Park, Mark Lawrence, and a 2-1 loss in Sofia. Uh, Brazil had drawn 1-1 with England just four days previous, with Yosemar actually almost being expelled after the game, after he uh, left his hotel in London to buy shoes at 7pm, only to return to his hotel the next morning. Uh, he was fined his match fee and was allowed to stay. They were going to kick him out, actually, but as long as he paid the match fee over or he relinquished it, uh, he was allowed to continue. A um, bit of trivia about that game, Martin. Yeah, 1987. I was only a wee pup then, uh, growing up in London, mad about football. But yeah, I was at that, uh, the England game. And um, Gary Lineker scored uh, for England. And a minute later, Mirandinha uh, of Newcastle at the time equalised. And interesting bit of trivia, Mirandinha was the first Brazilian player to play in English football. So that is you something are. to obviously focus on. But interesting you say about the match fees, and I think maybe some of our younger listeners don't know this, that yes. some international teams do get, their players are entitled to claim a match fee. Now, again, modern multi-million pound earning footballers these days, most of the fees they earn, uh, the technical fee they earn as a, for playing for England or Ireland, a lot of them kind of the player pool, as it were, they normally donate to charities now. A lot of them seem to do that. But the commercial deals now are a lot better. So if you're a Ireland international, you should get kind of commercial kind of rights as well and payments out yeah. of the player pool. But back then, it was a very, very important thing. Um, players didn't earn as much money then. And so, yeah, Brazil, when they came and played these tournaments, or which it was then the England game was a Rouse Cup game. So it was a kind of try tournament thing they think i think they did um they they would have got a match fee and obviously traveling over from where they were based and all around europe as well so they would, would have qualified for that but so giving up that it would have been a bit would of been a blow for him to swallow yeah for him to swallow yeah it would have been a blow and um also on that one had you gone to an Ireland match at that stage martin i had yeah i was in my first island game was in may 1985 wembley stadium packy bonner played um, I think Ireland lost one nil, two one, two one. Okay, but yeah, I've got the uh, I've got a nice pennant actually signed by Packy Bonner from that. That was my first Ireland game, nineteen eighty five, when I was six years old. That's giving away my age. Hmm. Um, but no, I hadn't been to a game at Lansdowne Road by this stage. But yeah, I, I regularly growing up in London, I went to lots so of England you. games from this stage. This is probably <laughs> one of the first England games I would say. Um, eight years well, no, you, you were at. I went to a lot of England games. You were at your first England game in nineteen eighty five. You just said it. Oh, yeah, well, there you go. Well, but I would have uh, gone to a lot of England games growing up near yeah. Wembley. Um, so there you have it, Martin Prendergast. And I can the design, match. I, well, I can also. For an um, Ireland game. I look, I, again, it's an interesting one. We will have to have a chat on this on a podcast about growing up in London and going to watch England games, like one of our good friends of the pod, Noel Mooney, did actually, who is now the CEO at the Welsh FA. We've had very similar upbringings growing up in North London, I think it was. And um, we often went to England games. And one thing. 
is interesting to kind of dispel a myth, which I will do on a future on. Green Machine podcast, is the wonderful England support. Because when I was going to England games, they weren't selling out by any means. Um, so that, yeah, but they, they were yeah. playing in a, in a ninety thousand seater stadium at the time. Yeah, but still, you know, they weren't they weren't quarter filling it basically. No, and and they used to England used to attract the best you know best teams as as we saw in eighty seven. Mm. With Brazil, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I can look back at my kind of match going. I know we're going off on a tangent. Here. We are, aren't we? But, but I can look back at, you know, often people will say the best player you played, in that. I, and I have looked back at England games I went to around this period, and and you know, Mar- I think Maradona was on the bench at one game, or but there was some. Um, I mean, I've seen some amazing players. Was that the league game? Was it the rest of the world? The against rest the of the world one. I think I might have been Brady at that. and McGrath. Yeah, yeah, um, but I think I've. I was trying to figure out if I'd seen Maradona play. I'm not sure. But there was, you know, as I can see, like Argentina came and played England. Brazil came and played England. And I've seen some incredible players and before they were kind of household names and went on to do stuff at World Cups. And that's what's an interesting one to cover about this Brazil side uh, back with Ireland um, is that, you know, you I know you said that Brazil were building at this time. Yes. Um, and in 97, they certainly were. But, you know, they were... 87. 87 sorry uh, they will go on though to um you know they would go on to the 1990 world cup and some of those players did very well at that as well yeah okay well here you go if you if you tuned in to listen to brazil <laughs> uh, you've clearly tuned into the wrong podcast oh god so there you have it martin Pendergast went to an england match before he did an Ireland match just say just say which uh, which they played against ireland so, yeah, but you you were in the england well end. brilliant like that's amazing a lot, a lot of people would say they went to their first away game before their home game Fair play. Yeah. Travelled. Travelled. Unfortunately, you, you, can, you can't say game. that either. But anyway, with your little scarf, with your little the hardcore. George's Cross. Yeah. Probably didn't know where you were. Right. Um, getting back to Brazil, 87. This isn't the Martin Prendergast podcast. Before the game, against Brazil, that is, Jack had said that he'd hoped Brazil would give Ireland a difficult game, which I think kind of raised a few eyebrows a bit. In his match notes, he would actually would double down on this, on his criticism of the Brazil team. And so he just basically came out, I was reading it, uh, of, uh, the actual program. He just came out and said it, that the team didn't compare, the Brazil team didn't compare to past uh, Brazil sides, ones he would have faced, to be fair, himself. Uh, and not, he would have played that Brazil team, wouldn't he, in 1970? Yep. Yeah, the Gordon Banks save yep. from uh, Pelé, the header. But yeah, it didn't compare to those teams of the past and pretty much failed the Mexico 86. Just said they weren't up to it. Weren't as good as their counterparts, uh, Argentina, who would obviously go on and win that World Cup. Uh, but he did say that they are a year older, a bit more experienced, because it was quite a young Brazilian side, a bit of an immature Brazilian team. He also went on, I thought this was fascinating, that he was proud of his players, his own players, of putting Irish football back on the map during the current campaign, which of course was the Euro 88 campaign. Although, truth be told, the Euro 88 campaign had actually kind of gone off the rails at this point. Uh, the group stage, Belgium were top with eight points. Ireland were second with five points. They both have played five games. And Bulgaria was sitting in third with four points, having only played three games and had actually beaten Ireland in Sofia two. No, one nil. No, two one. It was two one. Two one. Yeah. It was two one. Uh, another dodgy decision by a referee. Yeah. And also only the first team qualified because only eight teams played in the European Championships, which was the case up until Euro 96 when it was expanded to 16 teams. That, I, I find it interesting. The jury was still out on Jack, wasn't it? Obviously, results were, were, were starting to come together. The mantra was sort of breeding its way through the rest of the squad, but we weren't having the best. We, we had beaten Scotland 1-0 in Hampden Park, but it wasn't a great campaign at this moment in time was it? it it was really it was starting to stutter yeah i think jack is is still struggling to kind of get control of the squad here and and kind of lay down the law and of what he wants his irish team to look like and play like and probably some challenges from some of our senior pros within that squad yeah um you know he's still bringing players in obviously giving them debuts and things like that but he, he's still dealing with people from the owen hand era who would have been the first names on the team sheet of owen hand and were very unlucky, actually, in some respects, with Owen Hand qualification previously. Um, but challenging against teams like Brazil and, and and playing these top teams and even the qualifying campaign was going to 
kind of give him a bit of a experience and, and, and let the team develop. Um, and it's interesting, like you said, like Jack kind of basically slagging off Brazil and saying that they hope, hope they're going to give us a good, <laughs> a good game because he wants it to be competitive. You know, it's, um, you know, this is at the end of the season as well. You've got to remember that. It's a, it's a kind of a summer kind of glamour game where they're trying to attract and get fans behind uh, the team kind of coming at the end of the season. I'm sure the players were probably attracted to the, you know, the fact that it is Brazil was a nice kind of glamorous tie to come up against, but you know, they all wanted to go on their holidays as well. Although, although to be fair, it's, it's preparation for a few days later yeah. where they're going to be playing Luxembourg away. So, yeah, that's the thing. That isn't was it? the important one. That was the important one. Two points, not three, two points for grab against Luxembourg. That's what Jack would have been really focused on. Uh, funny enough, you say about a glamour friendly. Fans were told to arrive early to avoid disappointment, but we're accept- accepting cash at the gate. We'll get on to that a little bit later on, but... Uh, <laughs> Never a good sign when you're uh, accepting cash at the gate, even back in 1987. You know, speaking of this being a glamour friendly, you know, the Irish team did actually struggle at this point to attract top teams. Jack did as well. I, doing my notes up for this and other podcasts, you know, we would lose out on so-called glamour friendlies to England because they would just offer a lot more money. And, you know, they, they could play in Wembley Stadium, that kind of thing, where Lansdowne Road was a, or Daily Mount Park. This was apparently promised after the 7 0 drum, drubbing that if Ireland traveled to Brazil in 1982, that the Brazilians would uh, reciprocate. And it just took five years. So that's the only reason we got this game because no one really wanted to play Ireland. We were still very much the minnows. We hadn't qualified for a tournament at this stage, even though we were, Martin. We were the Icelandic Triangular Tournament champions. So a bit of respect, please to the likes of Argentina and West Germany at the time. Anyway, that's my rant over. So we're going to move on to the match. And we're going to have a look at the lineups. So Ireland's 11. I uh, Looking back in this, actually, this race, a few wide brows. But in goal, he had Bonner, number one. Number two, John Anderson, Jack's favourite son of Newcastle. Number five, Kevin Moran. Number four, uh, Mick McCarthy was captain that day. One of the few times, one of the early times, actually, he was captain. Left back, number three, Ronnie Whelan. <laughs> uh, number 11, Kevin O'Callaghan. Number eight, Liam O'Brien. And number six, Liam Brady. And on the right wing is Paul McGrath. Up front is John Aldrich, number nine, and Johnny Bourne, number 10. I think that's amazing, isn't it? Like Ronnie Whelan, one of the best midfielders in the world at this stage, at the peak of his powers, playing as a left back. And then you have Paul McGrath, one of the best defenders in the world, playing as a midfielder. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't make sense, does it? Typical Jack. Typical Jack, isn't it? I mean, but, and again, like, you could say it was genius. Is he doing it as a, like, tactical thing to take on match, like, an exceptional player? But I don't know if that's the case, really. No, this was a thing that Jack would do where I think he'd play, like, Ray Houghton as a, he'd play him out of position in midfield as well. I think it was... He wanted his fullbacks to play the ball to the opposite corner flag and basically play the game in their half. The whole pressing put them on. It's basically the crude, crude version of what you have now of what you know Klopp would do and other teams and all that kind of stuff. It's just a sort of a, a more direct way of doing that. And I think that's pretty much what he was doing. So let's have a look at the Brazil 11 in goal. He had Carlos. I, I'm not going to give it the full lash because I, I struggle to pronounce Irish names at the best of times. So... Um, <laughs> You had Yosemar, Ricardo, Silas, Valdo, Merendina, Muller. Lovely Brazil, Portuguese name there, Muller. <laughs> it's always a bit dodgy, isn't it, when you see German names in mm. South America? <laughs> they were from, you know, maybe, you know, did, did your grandparents move there? And then, never mind. Douglas, Marangon, Carlos, Eduardo, Edu II. I think I've done that right. That's right. Geraldio. Or Geraldo and Nelsino. God, that was uh, that that was scary, man. I was I was, I was sweating I'm trying to read that one out. <laughs> Niall Quinn was a doubt before the game, but he was finally released by Arsenal two days previous. Uh, they were worried about an ankle injury he had going on at the time, but he managed to convince them. No, I'm fine, and it was a bit of a bit of a uh, clubby country row, which he used to get back in the 80s. And at this time, the clubs had all the power. To yeah. be fair, which probably. You know, when you hire somebody like Jack Charlton, where Owen Hand used to struggle all the time, 
with the club managers, like you're dealing with Bob Paisley, you're dealing with Joe Fagan, you're dealing with Alex Ferguson, Ron Atkinson, all these guys. Ron Atkinson would have been the, the manager of Man United at the time. And then subsequently Alex Ferguson. If you're someone like Owen Hand, although Owen Hand wouldn't have dealt with Ferguson to be fair at United, very difficult when the clubs have all the power and you have to kind of tease the players out. You have to sweet talk the players out. But when you're someone like Jack Charlton, a World Cup winner, very well respected, won the Division Two title with Sheffield Wednesday, I think it was. Very well respected figure, almost a celebrity as well. That becomes a lot easier, doesn't it, when you have somebody like that who's well respected in charge of your uh, national team? Yeah, without a doubt. And that, that was the challenge that we, we do know that Owen Hand face. But yeah, Jack, yeah. Jack, I think he got in there early, didn't he, with some of them teams and he kind of set the tone. They would have known that he wasn't going to mess around too much and, and indulge them. So Frank Stapleton, who was normally the captain, was named in the original uh, starting lineup, which was actually announced the day before, by the way, because that's what he used to do back in the day, which would go with modern day football and brought back by Trapattoni many years later, where actually he would go one better, Martin, wouldn't he? He would announce his team a week before the game. <laughs> <laughs> Euro 22, the copy and paste management style of Giovanni Trapattoni. But anyway, uh, he had heard his back an hour before kickoff and was replaced by Johnny Byrne. And that's why Mick McCarthy was the stand-in captain at the at, for this particular match. Ray Houghton was out also. He was replaced by Liam O'Brien due to a stomach muscle issue. And he was just being rested for the game against in Luxembourg, which would be a 2-0 win, by the way. Ronnie Whelan's first goal for Ireland. And Tony Galvin's. There you go. A bit of trivia for you there, Martin. So just looking. Well, Chris Hewton, he wasn't in there. I don't. He would have just played in the 1987 FA Cup final, so I'm gonna guess that that's why he wouldn't have been yes taking plot. Oh, there you go. That's why we make a good team, Martin. When I miss <laughs> stuff, you're there right just to get the knife. In. I mean, to put the, the net <laughs> under me. Yes, thank you. I was just about to get to that. Yeah. I actually, I actually wasn't. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Uh, Chris Hewton would have been our. Yes, he he would have been there instead of Johnny Anderson, I'd imagine. Or would he yeah. have been, really? Because he was a left-back, and he had Ronnie mm -hmm. Wheeler playing as left-back. So, oh, don't know. But it's Jack, just being Jack, I suppose, as you said. Uh, Portsmouth's Kevin O'Callaghan was in for Sheedy or Tony Galvin himself. And Brady were actually in the team that lost seven years. 7-0, uh, five years previously. Kevin Galland, there you go. Another bit of trivia. Oh, lots, lots of trivia coming out of this particular episode. Mm. Oh, Richard Burke. And now Brady again. Super build up and right on the half hour. At some finish, that isn't it, by Liam Brady on the 33rd minute, giving Ireland a famous 1 0 win. Yeah, lovely. I'm mean, helped by the George Hamilton, fantastic commentary, friend of the pod. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but yeah, we do, we do love uh, George. And but yeah, great goal. And uh, you know, Brady's celebration, as I said, is iconic. And I like the fact that you know, Paul McGrath comes in afterwards, give a little hug as well. I think, yeah. What a team, what two brilliant legends together there. And yeah, but you don't do that against Brazil every day. So, you know, we take that now, wouldn't we? We certainly would. Uh, a bit more information on the game. The subs used uh, for Ireland. Davy Langham would come in for Ronnie Whelan. The man would come in for Mick McCarthy in the 63rd minute. And Quinn, Niall Quinn would come in for uh, Liam O'Brien. So he did, he did make it eventually, Niall Quinn probably much to the chagrin of George Graham. Uh, Brazil would have Romario coming in for Merendinha. Ray, Rai, Rai, R-A-I, <laughs> <laughs> comes in for Edu the second. And João Paulo comes in for Muller. Uh, Peter Byrne reporting on the match for the Irish Times had said that the result was our best in years. However, he pretty much thought the game was poor and said it would, as the way sport and history is, it'll, it'll be remembered a lot more fondly in years to come than it actually was at the time. So, which is kind of funny because he actually said in 2004 that they were magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he kind of proved his own point there, didn't he? And he also mm. mentioned uh, that pedigree is no match for power. And yeah, the Irish just sort of bullied them really as per Jack style. So it's kind of funny because, you know, people do look back at this. This is Brazil, you know, five time World Cup winner it looks really good when you go through the history books think, wow, we got a victory over Brazil. What an occasion. I think it was actually voted as, as one of the top, I think it was a Dublin radio station voted as the, the best Irish football moment. 
uh, of the last so many years or whatever, which I thought was was really, really funny because only 17,000 people showed up. And we alluded to this earlier in the game, uh, in the podcast, sorry, where, you know, the FER is saying, oh, you, you know, we don't be disappointed, show up early, but we are taking cash. And we know why, <laughs> because ticket sales were so bad. The game wasn't even shown on television, Martin. It was a 3 p.m. kickoff. And friendlies weren't shown live in Ireland of the Ireland matches until 1989 against France at Denimo Park. Not a bit of trivia for you there. And RT2, which normally I'd imagine would have shown sports back in 1987, they didn't start. The channel didn't start. And it was a Saturday till 3.40 p.m. And on the other channel, RT1 were showing a repeat of the over 55s Entertainer of the Year with Derek Davis. <laughs> it's just incredible. You, you know, when, when you look back at these things, and that's why I love doing this podcast, and I say this every week, because you, you, you just you just go through the bullshit, and you just throw cold, hard facts. Well, that's the thing. It's like, this is the 80s Ireland, and, you know, we haven't had the, the big tournament yet, 88. We haven't had it yet. We're still in the campaign to qualify for that tournament. Which isn't and, going very well at the time. No. And we're still struggling. And in in the mindset of the Irish public, the football isn't priority number one or even near it. And even if you bring Brazil to town, it's still not enough to kind of show the game on TV. And, and we didn't have floodlights at Lansdowne Road at the time. Mm -hmm. So the game had to be an afternoon kickoff. I mean, that would have put, you know, that would have put people off probably been able to see it, obviously. And, um, you know, even being able to travel during the day to, to go and watch the games. Um, Although it is a so, Saturday. So, I mean, it was still, we we're still very much nine to five, Monday to Friday. Yeah, day. yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think, you know, it, what I do like about the coverage is when you look back at the Brady goal is, you know, you see the fans and it, it this is kind of, dare I say, it's, it's, it's pre, pre Hillsborough. You can see the fans along the side of the pitch near enough jumping on the pitch when the goal scored and stuff. It's, it's a bit chaotic and limbs is the kind of modern day phrase, isn't it? When the goal goes in, but, that's the kind of that's where football was in the eighties, yeah. And um, it, I mean, look, it, it it is being looked back on as iconic as you beat in Brazil. It's just the name Brazil. I mean, it wasn't a fantastic performance, but yeah, it's a nice one to have for a scalp like that, isn't it? Yeah, it was, and you know, it it, it was sort of getting more momentum behind the Charlton era, the Charlton project at the time. But yeah, it's just fascinating when when you and and you see the pictures. I think you said in your book. And I've seen it reported that 30,000 people were at the game. But if you look at the pictures, there's no way, there's no chance in hell there's 30,000 people at that ground. They're like, they're, even where you see Brady scoring in the East Stand, there are just a plethora of green seats. We're still in the grasp of official Ireland, the GAA, the, the West Brits, the foreign sports, this kind of attitude where football, you, you know, even at this time, there's just not that much of an interest in, in football and and even RTE not getting behind it. And of course, you can still have the Sunday game, you have the highlights of the Sunday game. The Rugby World Cup was, was being shown live. That's another thing I found fascinating. The 87 World Cup was being shown live from New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> from, who's watching that? I'd love to see the ratings of that. Who's watching that in 1987? Maybe a lot. Maybe maybe I'm wrong there, but it's just just incredible. Just a whole different... Uh, although you, you'd still argue, though, wouldn't you, that RTE still have a... Um, a strange attitude you know we'd see this with the with the 2002 uh rights fees for the ireland team which eventually handed exclusivity to sky where rt actually lowballed the fei and offered them less money even on the back of a world cup qualification it's just always this weird perverse attitude i find to towards irish football with rte oh yeah of course yeah and 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 that that's despite us having some fantastic commentators, Jimmy McGee, George Hamilton, Tony Donoghue. Now, you know we've we've had that, and, and yeah, the TV thought rights is definitely something we need to have a chat about another time. Absolutely, George Hamilton, uh, one of my one of my favorites. Um, he, he is my favorite commentator. Just just I love his voice, his excitement. Jimmy McGee, <laughs> <laughs> not a fan. And uh, who was the other one you said? Tony Donoghue. Well, don't know that. I know of a Tony O'Donoghue, 
That's what I just said. I Tony, don't, I don't know if a Tony or done a goo. Uh, just, just saying. All right. <laughs> what was he said before we came on? Like uh, Gaelic. He didn't. He didn't study Gaelic in school. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, neither did I, Martin. Funny enough, I studied Gaelga. Ask Gaelic. Oh, right. Didn't clearly didn't do very well. But you know, just, yeah. Just putting it out there. Anyway, uh, that's all we have time for on this episode of this week back in the day. Please join us for the next one. And if you like what you heard, please support the pod. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Hit us to subscribe on YouTube, please. And give us a thumbs up and give us a review and all that kind of stuff. Also, head over to the website at thegreenmachinepodcast.com. That's thegreenmachinepodcast.com. And you can further support the, uh, the mission. It's God's work we're doing, Martin, isn't it? It is God's work, and it's also it love, love, love for Irish football, and that's yes. it. Exactly. That might piss off a few people, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're not afraid to do that here on this podcast. Uh, you can head over to the shop on greenmachinepodcast.com forward slash shop. You can buy a shirt, buy a badge pack with some stickers, and you know, a lot of love thrown in. That actually sounds weird. I, sh- I shouldn't say that. Uh, but yeah, please support the podcast. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. We're going to catch you on the next one, and all the best, and good luck. <laughs>